Before we start, I, I got a couple of things. First of all, I, I want to personally thank Alan and the staff of MSF for putting on such a wonderful cruise and educational program. Let's give them a hand. I think it's just, it's just oh, what a very nice job. Second thing is, uh, you know, you have my slides in your handout. I want you to put them away for now. Just set them underneath the chair and so that I can look at you and you can look at me and, and, and then you won't see my jokes ahead of time to kind of <laughs> screw them up, you know. I've got, I've got a real card here sitting here and, and, and so. Uh, oh, I saw some of your jokes. <laughs> yeah, you already are ahead of the game here. So, so uh, you know, I, I, uh, I love this title. I didn't come up with it. Alan came up with it, I guess. Don't come a knocking when the ship is rocking. Uh, I have been talking about sexuality and sex and multiple sclerosis for more years than I'd care to say. Uh, back about 30, 35, 40 years ago, uh, nobody talked about this. And I recognized that this was an issue in multiple sclerosis even back then. And the University of Minnesota put on a program uh, called the Program on Human Sexuality. And it, 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 I was already a graduated. I was always a, already a faculty at that time. But they forced every medical student to go through this several day program in which they really explored sexual issues like you wouldn't believe. They showed pornographic movies. They, uh, they had group discussions. There was a, it really tried to bring a focus on this. University of California at Berkeley had started the program. It moved to Minnesota. And then it was very politically charged, as you can imagine. Uh, what's happened in terms of our ability to talk about sex has dramatically changed as the years have gone by. People now are much freer about talking about it. But back then, nobody wanted to talk about it. You can imagine the Scandinavians in Minnesota talking about sexual <laughs> issues. It just was something they didn't want to do. So there were always protesters, and there were always articles in the paper about how difficult it was. But I found it very intriguing that they also put on a program for, for sexual dysfunction in people who had some disabilities of various sorts, spinal cord, multiple sclerosis, whatever it happened to be. So we got interested in that. And I started to lecture on it. And I became very uh, popular at that. that. People wanted me to lecture all over, the, all over the country on that. And I found that um, I was getting typecast. It concerned me. I didn't want to be the Dr. Ruth of multiple sclerosis. And so I, I, I took a conscious hiatus from doing that and stopped doing it except in situations where I was doing general lectures and had a section on sexuality. And a couple of years ago, uh, the National MS Society uh, in Long Beach, California put on a program. And they asked me specifically, would you talk on sexual dysfunction and multiple sclerosis? And I said, well, I haven't done this for a while, but I will. I'll do that. So I put together my slides, and I sent them out to them. And then I got a call. You can't show those slides to our population of people. Now, these were slides that I had, had collected over the years. There weren't anything unusual. I'd used them over the years. Never had I had anybody say, you can't use these slides. They're too graphic. I said, well, what do you want me to get up and say? Sex is good for those of us with multiple sclerosis. Do it. And not have any slides? I mean, if I'm going to talk on sex, I'm going to talk on sex. So I get very sensitive. Whenever I talk, I look out in the audience and I say, how many of you people are kids? And I say, this is an X-rated talk. Or if I see kids, if it's a big thing, I say, this is a G-rated talk. And we tone it down. This is the X-rated talk today. So just keep that in mind. If you're, if you're sensitive, maybe turn around. <laughs> Because it is an issue for people. Sexuality and multiple sclerosis is an issue in multiple sclerosis. You know, managing multiple sclerosis is about three broad categories. We heard Ben give an excellent talk on disease management. Disease management. Man well, that's what we'd all like to do, is change the course of the disease. And some of us were around before there were disease-modifying treatments. And now that we have disease-modifying treatments, we've seen a major change in the course of the disease, multiple sclerosis. Disease management. The backbone of managing multiple sclerosis is, of course, the managing the symptoms of multiple sclerosis. And then we have to realize that there is a person with this, this disease that we have to manage as well. 
psychological, personal, vocational, marital issues. That's what managing multiple sclerosis is about. It's about disease management, symptom management, and person management. So I want you to think now, and this is cut off here, but you can see it at the top up here I discovered. As a young man, a male's thoughts turn to athletics. This is just, just general. If you're a young person and you're a male, you think about athletics a lot. You think about your body image. You can see that outside uh, by the pool. Body image. You think about sex, for sure, as a young man. Matter of fact, this is a, a, a brochure from 2001 that the National MS Society of Minnesota put out about their, their men's weekend at Horseshoe Bay Resort. It's the men's getaway. You can see it up there. And up here it says men's getaway. And you can see kind of the, the unconsciously, they, did, they had a phallic symbol as part of their, their, their men's getaway thought. That's the natural thing. If you're a young woman, your thoughts are about friends and belonging, and your thoughts are about body image, Is and, it here? Hmm? Okay. and your thoughts are about career and about accomplishments and about sex. It's part of a young man and part of a young woman. As you become a middle-aged man, your thoughts are thinking about your career a lot. Family and relationships become really important. And your body image becomes important as well, as viewed by everybody around you. As a middle-aged female, your thoughts are about family and relationships, about career, and about your body image. Again, sex comes into play, young, middle-aged. As you're an older male, your thoughts turn to retirement. I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. You worry about your health more, I can tell you that. Support and companionship, and there it is again. I don't care whether you're young, middle-aged, or old, sex, and if you're a woman, you're thinking about retirement, about your health, and about sex as well. So as a male, you go from being strong, athletic, decisive, productive, sexual, you're the alpha male. And if you're a woman, you go from wanting to be attractive and capable and decisive and productive and sexual and caring. So men and women are quite similar in many different ways. But what does MS do to the male? Well, MS goes from, you go from being strong to not being so strong. You're feeling kind of weak. You go from athletic to being kind of klutzy, not, not the way you might like it to be. Decisive, you may have some cognitive problems associated with it. You go from being productive to less productive, and you go to that ED, erectile dysfunction with the sexual problems, issues. And you go from being alpha to maybe feeling like you're zeta. <laughs> and if you're a female, you go from feeling attractive to maybe feeling less attractive. You may not be, but you may feel that way. From feeling capable to feeling less capable. Decisive to cognitive, productive to less cognitive. Sexual to feeling less sexual. From caring to feeling dysfunctional. MS affects people significantly. Significantly. Now, I just was uh, able to watch on YouTube, a friend had shown me, a lecture on aging by a uh, California, Los Angeles weatherman, of all things, the weatherman talking about aging. His name was Fritz Coleman. And he, he made the point, I don't know if any of you have ever heard of Fritz Coleman. I hadn't, but, but wow, he's quite a guy. I, I'm, I'm really very impressed with him uh, after seeing this. But he made the point that when, when uh, you're young, whether you're male or female, your whole life is determined from down here. Every decision you make comes from down here when you're young. And when you get to be middle-aged, or if you have multiple sclerosis, or you get to be a little older, every decision you make comes from down here, <laughs> from down here. The difference is that when you're young, we're talking about sex. And when you're old, we're talking about your bladder. <laughs> every decision. Do I, do I go to bed early? Do I go to bed? It's made with how often do I have to be? When you're young, you know, you, you want to do it often, and you want to do it well and frequently. And when you're old, 
you do it frequently. <laughs> but one is peeing and one is sex. They're very, very different things. But they're all made from down there. So if you look at multiple sclerosis as a disease, it's a disease of women. Almost four to one. When I started out talking about multiple sclerosis, we said it was two to one. But along the way, it changed and became more, more frequent with women, four to one. Disease of females, as I say. The disease is said to be more severe in males. And we have this late onset spinal cord form, which is a little bit different than the regular kind of multiple sclerosis. I'd like to express some credit and gratitude for some of the slides and discussion that I'm going to have to a, a great psychologist named Fred Foley, who I noticed authored the book on sexuality that the MS Foundation has in the back there. He's a wonderful guy. and, and uh, and, and it gives a great talk on sexual dysfunction. And Elliot Froman, who's a neurologist in Texas, who, who is also an excellent lecturer and has talked about sexual dysfunction a fair amount. I like to talk about sexuality. And I put it up just this way, uality, because it's more than just sex that we're talking about. It's relationships how you feel about one another, how you relate to one another. Now, as a neurologist, I can tell you I feel really pretty comfortable talking about sex, but I don't feel so comfortable talking about the uality. We let our social workers and psychologists talk about the uality more than, uh, than I do, but it's important. This is about men and women. It's about partner acceptance. Now that you can't move, let's talk about us. That's the uality part of it. Intimacy is part of that duality, sexuality. And that's one of the issues that we have to think about when we think about sexual function in multiple sclerosis is the feelings that we feel. Sex, love, caring, sensuality, relating to one another, the actual intercourse itself. But we have empathy and protecting and conversation and touching and looking and honesty and body language. And you want to understand and commit and accept. These are all important things in any relationship. This is not a bang, bang deal. This is an actual relationship that we're talking about when we're talking about sexual. And intimacy involves that, but it also involves some rejection, loss of emotional control, fear of incont incontinence, reconciling abilities with disabilities, overcoming shame, Daring to act normal, being vulnerable. We all feel vulnerable at various times, confronting losses, technical difficulties. Intimacy is so broad ranging, and you can see why sexual dysfunction begins up here with all of these issues affecting how we feel. Well, we managed to go eight hours without arguing, and then we woke up. <laughs> After 20 years, we still talk. However, Leroy did stop listening about 10 years ago. 82% of men report sexual problems with multiple sclerosis. Erectile failure is the most common thing. 82% have some problems, erectile failure being the most common. 52% of women with MS report deterioration of their sexual activity. Often it's due to fatigue, inability to get that energy at the time it's needed. Sexual function starts with the arousal response. There's increased blood flow to the genital area. Then there's spongy tissue in the penis and spongy tissue in the clitoris. It's just like spongy tissue that gets in, engulfed with fluid. And that's what allows the erection of the penis to occur, the vascular engorgement that occurs in the penis and also in the clitoris. And at that time, there is release of nitric oxide, which is, if you listen to uh, satellite radio as I do, they're always trying to sell you nit nitric oxide things because of this particular issue. And there's lubrication that occurs naturally in the woman as erection occurs naturally in the man. This is the natural or uh, way sexual function starts with the arousal response. There are many factors that can relate to this. We were just, I was just talking with a gentleman who has diabetes. Diabetes can relate to this by the neuropathy causing a problem with the peripheral nervous system or the central nervous system that we see in multiple sclerosis can play a role in, in the arousal response. Obviously, your mood 
can play a role in the arousal response. You may be thinking of something terribly different that may have an effect on your arousal response. And the situation itself may have an effect. Sometimes there are religious issues and spiritual issues that come into play. So it's a very complicated thing that influences sexual function. And this can fluctuate with how your disease fluctuates. And so there are good days and bad days. The feeling, the desire, libido as we call it, may be affected by all of these different things and we recognize that. And things may not respond in the way that we would like from a sensory standpoint. You may have issues with pain or burning or uh, discomfort that may play a role in the sexual function. And then of course the bladder and the bowel plays a role along with fatigue. So there are a lot of factors that influence sexual function. Spasticity, as we heard from Ben, can, be, can play a role in this with muscle spasms as well. And then there are drugs. The antidepressants we talked about, what were talked about before, they can play a role in how you feel about sexual function, both directions. They can make it less desirable and sometimes people get hyper from them. But we have to realize that. And then there's relationships and then you don't talk about it. So sexual, the treatment of sexual function, to my mind, starts with talking, talking, relationships, talking. You've got to communicate. There's a code of silence that goes on in the office that if it's not brought up, it doesn't get said. Now, I gave a lecture on sexual dysfunction to neurologists many years ago. There was a doctor sitting in the front row of the uh, this is the physician talk that I was giving, and he was on his computer the whole time. I knew he wasn't taking notes. He didn't care. He wasn't listening. And at the end, he got very upset with me. He came up to me and said that, uh, you know, what I said was a bunch of baloney, that every doctor talks about sexual dysfunction at every visit, and that this is this and this. It was a break, and you know, when we got back together, I asked the doctors, how many of you talk about sexual dysfunction in the office? There were about 30 doctors there, and I was a little surprised. There were probably a half dozen hands that went up. I was surprised to see even a half dozen hands go up. After it was over, the half dozen hands basically came up to me and said they lied. <laughs> they just thought they'd put it up because they thought it was the right thing to do. Because people, doctors, don't talk about this. I knew that. That doctor that was so mad at me didn't understand that. He didn't like the way I was talking about it, but that's another issue. We need to communicate. We really do. And then people don't have misconceptions about self-stimulation, that like it's something you shouldn't do unless you're in the closet. And that the reality is that that's a natural human function that is part of the sexual uh, activities of all of us. And we have to look at our body image. So these are a number of the medicines that can ha have an effect. Some of them are blood pressure medicines. Some of them are antidepressants. Some of them are used for other things. Then we have the issues of the non-disabled partner. And there are a lot of issues that are psychological in nature. Resentment, guilt, despair, loneliness, shame, anger, misconceptions. If you're a caretaker, how are you a sexual partner? And I can tell you that I have seen all of these in my practice. All of them, not all in the same person, although that sometimes happens. But there's a lot of issues on both sides that have to be talked about to be dealt with. So how do we deal with it? Well, in the male, we deal with erectile dysfunction. We talk about the psychological issues, try to deal with them as best as we can, and then we deal with erectile dysfunction. I can tell you, I never heard the term erectile dysfunction. You know, we talked about a lot of things, but we haven't talked about that until Bob Dole went on television and made it popular. Now, that's quite a while ago. Some of you may not recognize Senator Dole, Vice President Dole. You, you know, he, he talked about it, and then I learned something. Every Republican has erectile dysfunction. <laughs> and in Florida, they particularly have electile dysfunction. Every year, it seems like, in Florida, and I'm talking to you guys back there, every year there's problems in Florida that I don't understand. I, every year. Sexuality. The male, we, we, we dealt with, ele electile, with erectile dysfunction initially when I was started in practice with a prosthesis. 
These were rigid rods that were surgically implanted into the penis. It didn't like that. They, they gave a constant erection. And for certain men, that was wonderful. For certain women, that was wonderful. But I had one uh, of my patient's wives come in to tell me, you put that into him, and he sees it as a battering ram. <laughs> so now, every night, I've got to put this go deal. So we have to think about you know, more than just that. But those prostheses got much better. They got much, much better. They got so you could pump them up, and they were elastic, and they came down. They were very natural, and we stopped using them. You, here's a reservoir here. You pump air in. It gives a nice erection, very workable. When you're done, you just let the air out and it goes back down. We hardly ever do that anymore. The urologists love to put these in, but they hardly ever do. Because along the way, after we got these prostheses, we found that you could take a, a medication and inject it into the shaft of the penis about 15 minutes before intercourse, and that penis would get a good, workable erection if you could inject your penis with a shot <laughs> about 30 minutes before. I couldn't even teach that. I sent that off to the urologist to do. It's not in my bailiwick. I find it kind of amusing today when people say to me, I don't want to take a shot for MS, and yet they're willing to inject yeah. their penis. I, 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 don't. <laughs> then came this vacuum device. And I was talking about this at lunch. It's a great lunchtime conversation. This vacuum device that you put this over the shaft of the penis, and then you squeeze on the trigger, and it pulls a vacuum in. And then you put a rubber band over, and it holds it there. I used, to, I used to sell these in the office, and we'd always try them out on the person before because I didn't want to sell to them if it didn't work. And it usually did work, but look at it. How exciting is that? How do you get in the mood? You know, you got the mood music going, the lights are dimming, and you pull out this vacuum device and start. So that wasn't very popular. You know what? Old folks seemed to like it, but the young people didn't like it very much. So then came Muse. What they did is they took that medication that we injected, they put it in a tablet, and you put the tablet into the urethra there, and then you rub it around a little bit, it gets absorbed, and it causes an erection. That was popular for six months. Six months. It's still on the market, by the way, but six months. Because, you know, timing is everything. Six months after that came out came Viagra, and then Levitra, and then Cialis. That's odd. This bottle of Viagra was full two days ago. I saw that. So now I've got some information that may be new to some of you. And you know, I always like to throw in some new information for people. And one of the things I've learned after doing this for many, many years is that men and women are different. Did you know that? They're different. In men, there are problems that are, you know, mainly around erection and lubrication. Otherwise, they're pretty simple. But they're different. They're really quite different. <laughs> so we have to deal with them in a, in a different manner. Why, yes, most of the medical research on your treatment was done by men on men. Has that been a problem, Ms. Pinsky? <laughs> so we have to deal with sensation issues in women. Sensation is a problem. Numbness, tingling, pain, burning can be a problem. In the female, the use of vibrators has become an important and essential under tool to dealing with sexual dysfunction. When I started talking about this, and this is really true, I would talk in Minnesota and I would talk about use of vibrators. And I'd look out at the audience here and I'd look at the women and every one of the women was looking at their feet. <laughs> Uh, there was no eye contact whatsoever. When I talked in California, they were all looking right at me. Right? But the, how to get a vibrator was the question. I mean, you have to go to the scuzziest place in town to get a vibrator in that era. And then came the internet. And you could get it by mail order. It came in a brown paper bag. You didn't even have to have it, anything on. But now you can walk into Walgreens. I mean, it's, 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 uh, times have changed. Vibrators have changed. They come in all sizes. They come in all shapes. 
they, we found that the wall powered ones worked better than the battery operated ones because they put out more stimulus. The use of a vibrator to help achieve orgasm is something that is very real and something that's very usable. And there are a whole flock of sex toys, if you will, and my wife hates it when I show these slides, but that's okay. <laughs> People have to, yeah, you may not have realized that they're all out there, but they're out there. They're all available and they're all helpful for men and women to achieve whatever they need to achieve. They're various and sundry. Some of them, I don't know how they work. And I don't even <laughs> want to imagine how they work. So I want to talk about a frozen bag of peas. I've become famous for talking about a frozen bag of peas because a frozen bag of peas can be used like a cheap vibrator, you know, you take that frozen bag of peas, you rub it in the clitoral area, you rub it gently, it, 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 comes, it takes care of pain, it takes care of numbness, and it gives a good stimulation, and, and I know what you're all wondering, what do you do with the bag of peas when you're done? You know, you can re, we can reuse it, or you can eat the evidence and get it away, or you can put it on your knee, you may need it on your knee, or you can put it back in the free. You know, there's many things to be done with a bag of peas, and, and people don't, I'll tell you, I, I wrote a chapter, Henry McFarland is the former chief of the neuroimmunology at the National Institutes of Health, very famous doctor, retired now. Neuroimmunologist, very famous, and he wrote a textbook, or he edited a textbook on, uh, on multiple sclerosis. And he came to me and he asked me if I would write the symptom management chapter. So I said, sure. And I wrote this elegant chapter, if I do say so myself, very elegant. And I had a bag of peas in there talking about sexual dysfunction. And he liked the chapter, but he wrote back to me and circled this bag of peas and put yellow marker on it and said, what the hell is this? Take this out. This is an academic textbook chapter. And I wrote back and said, this is a clinical chapter. Leave it in. And it was out when the book came out. But it's in my book, Frozen Bag of Peas. Now, I also want to talk to you about the Eros device. How many of you have ever heard of the Eros device? One. That's the usual response I get of the Eros device. It's not new, by the way. It's pretty old. But I never had heard of the Eros device until about 20 years ago, I guess it was, when a patient came into the, into the office and said, tell me about the Eros device. And I said, what the heck is the Eros device? Said, you don't know? It was on Oprah. Said, well, I don't know. I don't know. So I did an internet search on the Eros device. I typed in Eros. And after I looked through the first three or four porn sites for about 30, 40, 50, 20 minutes, I don't know how many minutes it was, I found the Eros device. And I looked at it, and I had an 800 number, and I picked up the phone, and I called that 800 number, and I said, you know, this is uh, Dr. Randy Shapiro. I'm at the MS Center here in Minneapolis, and, and I uh, would like some information on the Eros device. Nice young lady talked to me and explained it to me and said, would you like me to send you one? And I said, sure, I'd love to have one for the center. And she said, OK. And I said, by the way, where are you located? I'm sitting here in my office in Minneapolis. And where are you located? And I kind of expected Toronto or Los Angeles. She was in St. Paul. St. <laughs> Paul. We don't talk much across the river, I guess. And so she sent me the Eros device. And it looks like this. It's about the size of a, a, a palm of your a hand, is what the size of it is. And it's got this, this soft rubber applicator, if you will, that goes over the clitoral region, over the clitoral region. And then it's got a switch. On one side, you turn that switch and it vibrates. So it's a vibrator of the clitoris, if you will. And on the other side, you pull the switch and it pulls suction in, suction in. Remember that male one that I talked about that I didn't like too much? This is the same principle. You vibrate, you pull suction in, you get vascular engorgement, you get stimulation, and this is FDA approved for this purpose. That's what it's for. Can't get managed care to pay for it, but that's what it's for. <laughs> so the Eros device has been around now for all of this period of time. So we have to deal with sensation. We have to deal with feelings, so with communication, and look at the medication, and lubrication. And lubrication sure has changed. Again, we used to not be able to, to, to do much, say much about it, except go get some KY. You know, KY. You want water-soluble jelly, not Vaseline. But now when you go in the drugstore, 
there's red tubes and blue tubes and there's warming jelly and it's all in the sexual area in the drugstore because it's not, not so passe to talk about. We can talk about it now. We have to talk about positioning. So I told you I sent my slides to the folks in California and uh, they didn't want to, we had to have a discussion before I could give the talk. I, I ended up winning that discussion. Well, I sent my slides to the MS Foundation folks as well. And I guess I raised some eyebrows there too. <laughs> so um, I apologize if this is going to, but you know, there are things that we need to talk about and positioning is one of those things. So you need to experiment. And, 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 I, and I truly mean that. That means communicate with your partner and experiment as to what position works best for what circumstance. And don't be afraid of putting on a video in the, in, in the room at the same time, an X-rated video that might allow for some stimulate and add some mood music to it. And maybe light a candle or two and, and get the environment right. There's many different positions that can be utilized. These are just examples. I think I got these from Fred Foley. And, and I think they're important to understand as examples of how we deal with it. Now, medically, we have to deal with all of these other issues, but we can do that if we get people on the right page and thinking about it. But in the end, in the end, after we've done all of these things, I want you to give those peas a chance. <laughs>